Actually, the very first very silly question. How do I pronounce your surname? Wust. Wust. Or so Wust. Okay. Wust. Yeah. I, I, I want to get this vaguely correct. That, yeah. That's fine. Okay. So the reason I'm asking this is uh, I kind of wanted to ask like, how you got into music and then how, and how into neuroscience of music and that kind of stuff. And then I found a video on YouTube that might uh, give a little bit of an explanation or background. And it's called um, Five Times Wust. Is that I'm assuming your family, all of all of you musicians? Yeah, or? yeah uh, I mean, in my family, we learn uh, to play the piano at the age of six. That has been going on for ages, and I was taught that. My siblings were taught that. My sons have been taught that. So that's the important. I, you know, my father is um, is a teacher, and he 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 never did. He never really um, was interested in. Uh, in in knowing our grades from the school or you know he, he wasn't interested in how we did in school but he said one thing you have to learn how to play the piano you learn you have to learn how to ski and you have to learn to play golf because those things you cannot uh, learn if you uh, become older so so that's that's basically where where i come from so i'm assuming you can do all three or did you did you fail i can do all three i would okay. say yeah that's right. That's that's good. And then the, I mean, your main instrument is the bass, right? So that it's came a bass, later yeah. then, or yeah, that came later. It was in the beginning. It was an electric bass for many years, and then I realized I was best at playing jazz. And uh, when I had been playing electric bass in jazz for some years, I realized that it actually sounds better if it's an acoustic bass. And I, yeah, so 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 that took me some some years to learn to play that, but I. I entirely play acoustic bass nowadays so yeah I, I i played on a little bit more than 100 records and uh i'm a professor at the royal academy of music so yeah exactly it was pretty cool that uh just how yeah how much music of you is out there i mean i um i wanted to read another paper in preparation but i just ended up listening to more of your music and stuff <laughs> uh, i just got distracted <laughs> um, <laughs> but Very i have nice. read some so don't worry i that's am prepared good. That's um, good. but uh, yeah, I mean, I actually also played double bass, um, but I played it um, classically, so I never really played jazz. Um, I'm curious, like, did you start, like, always jazz or? No, no, no. I started out uh, being mostly interested in the Beatles, uh, Paul McCartney, then uh, Paul Simon. And uh, from from there, I think, uh, suddenly I was, uh, I was on a tour in the States with a band and uh, we were playing 70 gigs in the States around. So we were uh, uh, driving in this Greyhound bus and then I started listening to some jazz because I had the feeling that you could learn something from it. I basically didn't really like it. And then I so listened to that. How old were you at this point? It, it, uh, sorry? How old were you at this point? Oh, I was actually 20. Two or twenty-one, something oh, okay. like that. So, so I I started playing jazz pretty late, uh, but then then I listened to Chet Baker, uh, Stan Getz, Pat Metheny, uh, and uh, you know di different stuff at that uh, point in time. And then suddenly I realized that I started like it, liking it. So, and and then I realized also that I was actually better at playing that than I was at playing rock. Rock and roll, for instance. So, yeah. Hmm. Okay, so I would have assumed that playing jazz would be harder, just technically, than rock and roll. Is that just a false assumption? Yeah, I I always had uh, this very good ear, so uh, from early on I could play anything I heard. So, like, I could basically play uh, the whole Beatles repertoire, repertoire when I was I was thirteen, twelve, thirteen, like all the chords in Beatles because yeah, for some reason, and that is a fantastic skill to have when you play uh, jazz because yeah. it's the most important thing. So that's why. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, I want to talk today mainly about. Um, I mean, the, the one article I've read in depth is Music in the Brain, the Nature Reviews Neuroscience article. Um, maybe for anyone who's new to the podcast, uh, I always put references and links to everything we discuss in the description. Uh, and I'll put that, that paper there too. See, so, yeah, I mean, I am, so, you know, I'd like to talk about kind of the neuroscience of music and your work in there, but um, kind of just just to make the bridge be kind of between like the biographic stuff you just mentioned. Like, how do you go from there to suddenly being professor of neuroscience uh, yeah, and having your own lab? 
That's uh, that's a long story. You can see I I was t trained as a mathematician. So while I was in my early twenties, I started having a lot of gigs. You, you know, it I, I practiced a lot, and I was also uh, going to the university. I had my French degree when I was in, which is a bachelor's degree when I was twenty. And then I started on mathematics. So I have a mathematical degree, that's a master's degree. And then I also ha have a degree in music. So this was sort of, my hobby was mainly going to the university and my gig was to, to play yeah. music, right? So, so it turned out that way. And then I was hired at the conservatory, which is or the Royal Academy of Music. And soon I suddenly had a, a tenureship there. So I wasn't thinking much of it, but I I had this idea that I wanted to write about the Miles Davis Quintet from the 60s because I think their music is so fantastic and interesting. So I wrote a book on 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 the, the polyrhythms in the Miles Davis Quintet. You know, for a mathematician, that's not a long stretch. So so it's that was kind of what I was interested in, and I actually had a, a small or I had one year of money to do that uh, i i applied for it and i got uh, i got it from from one of the councils research councils on my i'm on my face basically so so i wrote that one and then uh, i was offered a phd at a new new center for neuroscience because the director of it was interested in jazz he was an amateur jazz musician and he has, had read the book and he was thinking, hmm, and this guy's a mathematician. Why shouldn't he be able to do neuroscience? So, but... Wait, so uh, but a, you were a professor of, of music and then the, the other said, like, do you want to do a PhD now? I was a, an associate professor of music already at that point. And then uh, this guy said, would you want to do a PhD? <laughs> and I said, well, that sounds really scary. Uh, let's do it. So, uh, so, uh, and, and, and then I, sp I've spent 20 years doing this and, uh, you know, built from one. I mean, I did took, did my own PhD. Then I got one PhD student. Then I got two. Then suddenly I had 13 PhD students. And then I thought, well, I might try for a bigger grant. And then I got this enormous grant and one more. And, uh, yeah. So nowadays we, I think we are 35. At my center, so it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. So uh, luckily nowadays I'm not supervising everybody. So um, we are five, or we are four very prominent professors. Uh, Morten Kringelbach, who is also a professor at Oxford University. And then there's Peter Keller, who is also really well known and has had a Max Planck professorship. Uh, and is from Sydney, Australia. And uh, then there's Elvia Pratico, who uh, was uh, employed in Finland bef before she came to us. She's Italian originally, also very, very prominent professor. So, yeah. I mean, maybe one last question then about the about this side um, before we get into the neuroscience. Um, kind of one question I had in general was kind of like, how do you combine these two things, right? Because music, you have to practice, you have to rehearse, um, that's just to play, right? If you want to compose stuff and that kind of stuff or record it, then that's a whole other thing and the research thing. So I'm just curious, like on a, on a practical level, how do you do that? Do you have, I don't know, you set aside like half a day each or is it, yeah, how does it work? I mean, yeah, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's, it, it's been a challenge since, since I was 18 years old and started at the university, right? And it's still a challenge. But basically, I'm very, very good at structuring my time. I get up super early in the morning and then I practice. So every day, not, not just every day, every single day, I practice my instrument in the morning before I do anything else. So, uh, because you can't, you can't, uh, you can't play an instrument at a high level unless you are always in shape. So, uh, so that's just the cost of, of living like this, I think. And when I was, when I was uh, studying in my twenties from, I was 22 till I was 30, I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a television, so so that frees up a lot of time. I mean, at that time we didn't have, uh, you know, Facebook and what you can spend your or YouTube or whatever. So basically, I didn't have any of that kind of um, input. So I was free in the evenings to play and do stuff and uh, play with others and so forth. So 
So it is possible, but it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot of planning ahead, I would say. But nowadays I play around 60 gigs a year. And like you said, we just put out this record, which has had enormous, has been really well received uh, in the Danish media. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of, uh, it's difficult. I, I would say it's difficult, but it's mostly a matter of really wanting it. And then having the discipline to do it and... But you know, this is also about the brains. You know, our brains is shaped every day by what we do. So if you teach your brains that you get up in the morning, it may be hard the first week. And if you then say, okay, on the Friday, I didn't, I didn't manage to get up and practice. So then it's, it's suddenly forgot, forgotten or it's soon forgotten. But if you then, if you can keep on doing it for like, three months or four months, then suddenly that's actually what your brains will expect of you. So um, for me now, it's it's so obvious that I, if if I don't do it one day, it's terrible. I, I and 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 actually just today for good reasons I wasn't able to manage. So now I have to do it in the evenings. If I don't do it in the evening, I'm simply not satisfied. So yeah. Yeah, I need, I need to get back into that. I started taking piano lessons again recently, so I hadn't taken them oh. for like 10 years and I just played occasionally. I mean, so piano was probably my main instrument. And now I'm in this phase where for the last few weeks, I've basically, every day is like, oh, I should practice again. And then I don't get around to it because I just haven't built up a routine or anything like that. Um, routine so yeah, is, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, I can, it's really the routine. I really need routine. to get into that. Yeah. 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 Anyway, um, so uh, I guess the, the article they were talking about is, to some extent, I feel like it's kind of an overview of the predictive coding of music model yeah, um, and all that kind of stuff. So maybe can you give a brief overview? Maybe let's maybe just start with predictive coding, um, kind of yeah. what's predictive coding I, and why I would, do we all? Yeah, I, I would say that, that the, the article is, which came out uh, a month ago or something like that, the, the article, the I mean, the, the purpose of the article is, of course, predictive coding, but it's also to give an overview of the whole literature of music in the brain. So I would say it's it's uh, you can read it even if you don't buy into the predictive coding theory as such. There's yeah, yeah. this and and the idea in the article you you could say it's the predictive coding is a framework for understanding how how music is understood by our brains. And uh, the whole basis of this is that if you look back in time you were talking more about representations in the brain that you would talk like you you uh, experience the the world you experience different things things come into your senses and back in the day you would say well that makes an, a representation in the in the brain and i think predictive coding diverges from this understanding by saying well actually it doesn't come into the brain. The brain already, when it comes in, has a prediction of what is going to happen. So even at the first note, so if I sing, da, then your uh, brain will already have a prediction of maybe the tonality, maybe even when is the next note going to come. And when you get the next note, it will create a better prediction. And maybe, uh, so, so So the, the idea is about it behind predictive coding is that what the brain is trying to do is that it's trying to make sense of the world by sort of reverse engineering and say, if this is the input, what is, uh, what, how does that fit my model? Is my model correct given the input? Put? And it does so like in a hierarchical way. So, so the different areas of the brain will all have predictions and feed forward prediction error and get back uh, predictions from higher levels in the brain. So that's that's the idea behind predictive coding. And in a in a in a way, it's it's very intuitively correct because it must um, be easier for the brain to to do the calculation that the brain does uh, all the time. Of course, if it only has to uh, has to process what is different in the input. So, I mean, if you have a model, let's say, and and music is such a good example of it. That's also why why we we think it's it's worth writing about, because if if you think about music, if I, for instance, sing, dum bum 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 ba, then 
you have your your brains will already think okay this is the this is a major it's a major scale and boom this is the the tonality da, 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 and so forth and it also has a meter dum bum two three four one two three four one two or whatever it it makes for for predictions and all these these predictive models is something that the music that you that that then enters your ears will play around with in a way so if i say bum bum then you think this is the uh, this is the downbeat and uh, so 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 that would be the downbeat so that, and and probably a 4/4 four, four. so if i just go bum bum then you have already the downbeat uh, and and you probably also think that this is the uh, key of the the the, the, the tonality but in fact it could easily be that this was the um, this was actually the the tonality bum 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 ba da 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 ba da oh, oh that would still be i had i couldn't change but uh, anyway <laughs> i know what you mean yeah ba da ba da 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 so now you have a different tonality yep. Uh, and also bum bum so you could even have uh, so so if you say bum bum you go, would go one two three four bum bum so that's a one right but it might even be that a one two three four bum 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 ba, da, 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 da. so we have like a predictive framework when we listen to music and we can't get away from it you can even take bistable percepts for instance as for instance uh, three against four If you have a three against four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. So when you count them off, this is exactly the same acoustical input to, to our brains. But whether you count it off in four or in three, it gives a completely different, it, it's a completely different experience. Yeah, maybe to clarify to the, to the listeners, you were, the, the snapping was the same. Each yeah, time. This, it just sounds so this, very different. The yeah. snapping is always the same. I'll do it again. So, so the snapping is the same, but when I change from counting it off as a four four meter a march to a waltz, then it suddenly sounds completely different. So I'll try to do it again. One two three four. One two three four. One two three four. One two three. One two three. One two. So dang 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 dang. It sounds completely different. So so uh, differently. So so um, it almost becomes more like a Spanish dance or something. Exactly. Like, rather than a waltz. And, yeah. and 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 this is this is uh, th at least when you listen to music, then it's very clear that the brain helps you construct the reality. And and this is a key point in predictive coding. It is that the brain is trying to figure out what is the hidden causes of its input. And the hidden course in this instance is either a four four meter or three four meter. And what it does is that it's trying to calculate the probability that the course that it has figured out, like the four four meter, is correct given the input. And in fact, when you hear ex or when you listen to exactly this uh, three against four uh, rhythm, then when we are from the Western world or Germany or Denmark, we it's much easier for us to uh, listen to this as a three four meter a waltz than a four four meter. Whereas in some African countries uh, like Ghana, for instance, you would probably uh, the the four four meter would would be at least equally as as relevant as the three four meter. So, so this this tells you something very deep about how the brain makes sense of the world and what learning is all about. Because in a way, what predictive coding then says is that. What the brain can do when it 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 experiences a conflict, for instance, like this th three against four, there there's a conflict. It might be the four that is the cause or the three that is the cause. Then it can either change its prediction, which most Westerners would do to this rhythm. Oh, they would go, oh, okay, it was actually a three four meter, and then they will just switch to the three four meter, or we could tap our feet. Uh, that means that we could act to resample the environment, and when we do that, that then you could actually keep the four four meter even if it's less, 
easy for you to do than, uh, or the four four meter, even if it's less easy for you to do than the three four meter. So you resample the environment by moving your body and trying to keep the rhythm. And so now you have perception and action linked with this predictive coding uh, principle uh, to each other. And when you de- when this happens, you probably also experience some kind of emotion. There will be some kind of reward, maybe even, uh, and and you'll also learn stuff over time because that would mean that you will change your further possibilities of of how you can predict what is coming in. I have um, one kind of uh, like big picture question here: Is um, so like the predictive coding of music model? Is that? I mean, whilst I was listening it, whilst I was kind of reading the article, I felt like this is, I mean, it's its kind of in that sense standard predictive coding, right? It's just saying like the context of music is a really good way of looking at it. Yeah. Is, is that the way or does is it actually something slightly different? Like, is it a, a different variant of predictive coding or is it just a really good yeah, context? I, I hope it's not a different version of uh, predictive coding. Okay, that's coding. the way it appeared to me, but I wasn't, yeah. No, I, I, I hope, oh, and, I, and, and as Carl Friston is uh, one of the authors of, the, of, of this paper also, I hope he would have uh, caught us uh, if we were uh, saying something that wasn't completely true, co- predictive coding-wise. But I think one thing that is slightly, uh, so... So it's also investigating how long can we take, uh, how well does predictive coding fit music in, in a way? And, and one thing that I think is at least something that you start uh, thinking about when you, when, when, when you look at it, uh, at music in a predictive coding way is what music does is that it basically creates prediction error that the brain has a hard time explaining away. So in the predictive coding setting, it, uh, I mean, the, the standard predictive coding says, well, uh, what the brain is trying to do all the time is that it's trying to uh, minimize prediction error, either by uh, changing the uh, prediction or, 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 t- or t- trying to, uh, to resample the environment by acting or acting uh, and then resampling the environment. So that's basically what uh, what the brain has to do. It has to try to minimize prediction errors so that it can free up its energy for other stuff. But in music and in art, it, what art really does is, is that it creates prediction error that is hard to get rid of. I have this example of a, you know, it's a piece of art from, that I saw at the art museum in Aarhus. And I, 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 I took a picture of it, uh, with my, my, my camera. And then it, what it has, it's basically one line, but then there's these two annoying bumps on this straight line. And, uh, and then uh, there's some colors, but it's, it's very, very simple. It's actually the U- Ukrainian flag. So, so usually when I do lectures, I, I ask people to look at this, uh, this, uh, picture. And then I say, what, what are you looking at? And then they, nowadays they say the Ukrainian flag, but, but, uh, you know, basically, they also this look from at the these sixties or something, right? Like exa- the exactly, yeah. exactly, and and you know it's so annoying that these two annoying bumps on this uh, straight line, and that's of course our eyes would like a, a, the easy thing for uh, for our eyes would be to follow the the straight line. So when there's something that doesn't fit the straight line, which is our prediction uh, or normal prediction, because we have so many straight straight lines, then. We actually we are we are caught up with looking at these two annoying bumps, and you can't get rid of it because it's 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 schematic knowledge that straight lines uh, lines are straight, right? If they if they start out being straight, they should end up uh, being straight. That's that's kind of the prediction we would have. And the same thing in music. When I go da da la da da wa pa, so. No matter how many times you've listened yeah. to this, you still think, okay, that's an odd note. That's, that's not how it should be. That's schematic uh, expectations. And there are so many in music. And this is what we learn by statistical learning when we are small kids and we, we learn the different um, schemes that music is from our culture, right? So, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, do you, so this is something I've, I've been wondering about since reading your article, which is, I mean, so you talk about especially the precision weighted prediction errors, so the, the and these kind of things. So prediction errors, uh, depending on how confident you are on them, can be um, weighted stronger or less strong, you know, that kind of stuff. And I've been wondering, like, if you, like, if you know a music piece really well, do you, do you still have a prediction error or not? Of course. Or like, how does that work? Because you know exactly what's going to happen. Or if it's something, there's a syncopation in a piece or something like that, like, and you know it's going to come. I don't know. Do you think you still have one, or is it, or is the error just weighted very low? Or yeah, I'll bring it back to the straight line. So you could probably look at this picture every day for the rest of your life, and still, when you look at it, you're you're thinking, why couldn't he just have drawn a straight line? <laughs> I mean, this is this is so. And and uh, the way to explain this, I think David Huron does it better than I I can. But what he says is that. And this is special for music that yeah, that we can listen to a piece of music for so many times for some reason, right? But the thing is that what the music does is is that it plays around with our schematic predictions and our short-term predictions and our veridical predictions. And even though your veridical predictions, the predi pr predictions that you get from uh, listening to a piece many, many times, you know, of course, da 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 wa pa I mean, now you know I'm doing it, but still, part of your brain, the schematic brain, will say, "No, it should have been da 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 whoop up, right?" So, I had so, to overwrite it basically in my head. Yeah, yeah, it's like it, he's not going to do it this time again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, yeah, I mean, and you, I'm not so, going to fall for this twice. <laughs> no, you're not going to fall. But of course, when you have a piece of music, for instance, and you listen to it ten times, then there's a one thing that I have no, I noticed already when I was a kid. The records that I didn't like at first were the records that I liked the most in the ending. Because probably, or my, my guess is that because it's so nicely done, the music, you have exactly the right amount of prediction error according to the, your schematic and short term predictions. So that once your veridical predictions are satisfied, so you know, okay, now I don't have to worry so much about that anymore then you, you can actually start really appreciating the interplay with the other predictions. So in the beginning, like, like some, some songs just strike you uh, momentarily. Oh, oh, I already like to listen to this, this music. And then you listen to them t uh, 10 times and you think, okay, that, that wasn't that interesting. Cause now your, your veridical predictions have, have been satisfied and then, uh, uh, s some of the other stuff uh, might not be that interesting. So so I think it's this interplay between the different types of memory sy systems that we have in the brain, in fact. Yeah, I like the example of listening to music for the first time. I mean, for me, so when I said I did lots of classical music, I especially liked a lot of the kind of 20th century classical music. And I remember still the first time I listened to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. And at first I was like, I don't know what, do I like this? I don't know. It's kind of weird. I'm not sure whether I understand what's going on or something like that. And then, you know, you listen, I listen to it more and more because I felt there was something then. Now I really like it. But the funny thing there to me is, I mean, I'm probably losing like half of the audience now. Uh, but that's just a specific example. But No, but it's um, a really good example, actually. And I, I'm especially curious about the last section because the last section there is this like super irregular rhythm where it goes like you know five seven three eight whatever yeah exactly all this stuff and, right it's yeah fantastic. I've listened to it so many times and I still have I'm always wrong with predicting what the next note is going to be and when it's going to come I don't I'm curious like yeah I mean I have I guess I have predictions there I clearly have predictions they're just always wrong even though I've listened they're to it, so. they are always <laughs> kind of wrong even Stravinsky's own predictions were wrong right because he started out uh, he he when he wrote it the first time he wrote it as uh, three eight five eight uh, seven eight and so forth in in changing uh, meters. But then he found out that he the only way he could conduct it was in four four, and then he actually made a new version where he had written it in four four. So okay. there you have a very good example because for for my when I listened to it the first time I was just thinking, well, I guess it's some kind of twelve eight or something uh, like that. Um, but but the the idea is, I I think is that you can. In fact, you could take different viewpoints. You could change your predictions all the time, like that. So that would be that would be just uh, shifting with every da 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 
So now you want to, want to, want to, you want to, or whatever it, 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 it goes on. So you change your meter all the time, but you could also just go one, two, three, four, da, 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 da. And so, I mean, yeah. So, so, uh, that wasn't 12, eight, but, but in just, uh, uh, in, in principle, this, I think is, is such an inter interesting thing where you have a sort of bi-stable, um, bi-stable per perception. And very importantly, he didn't, he didn't, he did not only do this. He also had this E flat, uh, uh E flat, uh, major, major triad F on top of, yeah. So, uh, the so, F ma flat major, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's really dissonant. But because it's so dissonant, you, Almost, it's almost good that it's both uh, dissonant on the harmonic and the rhythmic level, because uh, yeah, it, I think one wouldn't go without the other. Then there would be there would be a, a too big discrepancy between the rhythmic and the uh, ha harmonic um, uh, layer in the music. It's a wonderful. I wish I actually remembered it precisely how how the rhythm went but uh yeah anyway <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i mean just um what kind of one question i mean so one thing that you already alluded to earlier is kind of like different cultures and these kind of things and um i'm just curious like to what extent i just say kind of the, the 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 edges of what we might define as music so especially when you look at 20th century music there's a lot of it that at some point people go that's not really music and it all becomes like increasingly philosophical philosophical or something if like stockhausen or whatever and you mentioned in the article, you mentioned Schoenbeck briefly. I mean, is that like a completely new system of music that you have to learn so you understand what the predictions are in that system? Or kind of how does that work from a predictive coding of music kind of perspective? Yeah, I, I yeah, it's it's hard to say. I think that um I think Schoenberg deliberately wanted to get out of all these predictable patterns. And what he I think what he actually did when you do an analysis of it, he makes it always or, or even more unpredictable than if you had done it uh, randomly. So he avoids any kind of predict, uh, predictions by making it it's so unpredictable. And that gives you, it, it gives you a texture, a prediction texture that, that, that is in, in a way also it has its own, its own predictability in this. I mean, it, this is really hard to uh, try to explain, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, the 12 tone system where you can't repeat a, a, you have to do all the notes before you, 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 you hear them again. And then you do these different uh, inversions and all, all the stuff that you can do, uh, do with it. Uh, so it's sort of a mathematical system, but to my ear, when you have, you, when you have listened to it some a couple of times, I really find it extremely nice because it doesn't have the normal. It it stays away from, da, 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 da. you know, it stays away from all yeah, those yeah. kind of uh, uh, predictions, and that has a, a big virtue to it. So uh, I think what he's trying to do is to, yeah, he's he's making music that is very hard for most people to to grasp, but. But I think that there's still some kind of prediction, uh, uh, predictive coding that he, that he plays around with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah, I mean, hard I find to explain. It, yeah, I find it <laughs> also, I mean, I have to admit, like, I, even though I like lots of 20th century classical music, the 12th tone and, and serial music from like Boulay or something, I just never got into. I never quite got it. I don't know, because maybe it was never explained to me or I never like looked into it that clearly. Um, but I do find it interesting that there's kind of some music that you have to, I should say, I guess kind of we grew up with like a particular music system. And if you grew up with that system, then it could be really hard to listen to other stuff and still find it interesting. I mean, I find like it's for me, it's very broad in terms of also other cultures. But yes, for some, I like 12 time music or something that's, I guess, intentionally so different that I never... Um, really got into it but here of course you have to listen to it many times to the same piece of music so honest honestly my my repertoire is super uh what can you see slim but I, the things that i've been listening to i've been listening to many times and it's the same thing for me with the i'm a big fan of john coltrane but his l last records or, or the ones from from the mid 60s they're so just before his his death uh, they're so hard to listen to because but when when you do it 
when you do it enough, like one record, you 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 say, okay, I really want to listen to this. Then your veridical, when you, if you can stimulate your veridical expectations long enough, you get an extreme amount of beauty in the other stuff. So, so yeah, it's it's hard, but I I think you have to allow yourself to only, for instance, know one piece of Schoenberg or uh you know yeah or, or the others also i mean i have to admit like the a, what's it called like a survivor from warsaw or something like that that's one that i think i could like to me there the whole system makes sense it's just i think okay, that it makes okay, perfect yeah, sense yeah, yeah but um yeah i don't know the piano music or something yeah maybe i guess i just have to listen to a piece so often so I actually like know what it is and then get it to, i don't know i mean like in in, in school I, I took music very um like to an advanced level, and we discussed Luciano Berio's Sinf Sinfonia. And that's a piece that the first time I listened to, like, um, one of the movements, it's like, I have no idea what's going on. Like, it just seemed like random. And it's like, it's, I don't know. Like, you know, but then we discussed it. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, this is actually really good once you understand what's going on. It just it, it takes a lot of kind of education to get to the level where you can actually appreciate it but I, I have to say i don't have a full overview of classical music it's like these i know these pieces very well i know Mahler's fifth i know of course a lot of the all jazz musicians love uh love bach for some reason uh so yeah. so so i know of course i play the cello suites basically every day so or parts of it of course you don't play all of it, all of it but but so so uh, so i wouldn't i always was mostly interested in in the French composers Satie, uh, 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 Debussy Ravel, uh, Debussy or... Ravel, uh, and also, uh, and I forget the name of this who was more like Schoenberg, who had these fantastic ideas where he had the same pitch should have the same note length and so forth. He had this whole system of 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 stuff. Anyway, doesn't matter. So it's it's not my speciality. Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just found an interesting case because I guess. At some point, you get to the point where, yeah, I wonder whether people still consider it music or not. Um, yeah. So like, yeah. but one thing that I think is super interesting is that I used to uh, teach uh, teach music theory at the Royal Academy of Music, and I still fail to find an, a, a theory a theoretical examples sample where I couldn't use Beatles as an example. It would have been <laughs> become a little bit boring if I if I only had that, but. It's so interesting how much they were actually, how broad they were able to, broadly they were able to expand their musical interests over those seven seven years that they made records. It's it's, it's still it still baffles me, I have to say. Also, that it's such a short period of time in which they yes. made that music. Yeah. Did Did you watch the the Peter Jackson movie? The documentary that came yeah, out. The recently. document. Yeah, no, I haven't seen yeah. it yet. It's it's mind blowing. I, I watched the whole nine hours in one stretch. Or we we played a little bit. We were three three mu musicians who sat down and watched it, and we played a little bit in the interludes. We could, we simply had to play, but yeah, yeah, yeah that was uh, that was amazing. Amazing. Anyway, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. I mean, one thing, one example I could just sound funny is the the you use the example here of syncopation, and uh, and the the what's it called again now. Uh, blame it on the boogie by the Jacksons. Oh yeah, and uh, it's funny. I like you wrote like it's difficult not to tap your feet, and I, I just saw like don't blame it, blame it on the boogie by the Jacksons. I, I I didn't know the song, so I listened to it, and so I started like tapping to the beat, and then read like it's difficult to <laughs> not do that. I was like, oh yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, there, and, and yeah. Sorry, I should I should mention that there is a little uh, caveat to that, or an extra thing to that, because it's also, of course, why it, the the lyrics goes. I just or go. I just can't. I just can't. I just can't control my feet. That's why we wrote it. it it's a little bit of a joke, but uh, yeah. No, I mean, anyway. it's, it's a perfect example. Yeah. Yeah, maybe just about the. So there's one part that I didn't quite understand, and this this relates to the to this part about. I guess you use the example of syncopation to explain the idea how active inference works in this kind of predictive coding of music sense. And I didn't quite, I'm not sure I quite bought the explanation or I didn't, maybe just didn't quite understand it. Yeah, I guess, yeah, maybe can you, can you maybe explain that in a bit more detail? Because I didn't quite understand how you exactly reduce your prediction errors by reinforcing the beat Oh yeah, that's that's a good that we did discuss this with Carl and and the thing is that 
if you, if you go back and and think about the three against four, then the brain has this prediction, or one of the predictions that it has. There there are other predictions, but one of the predictions is tapping to the beat, and the beat is probably think about it in the brain. It's probably it, it's probably mediated by the by the motor system. So you can see that also from from studies from. Uh, Uh, from uh, uh, Benjamin uh, Morillon, uh, who did these studies where he could show that the beat prediction were actually sent to the auditory cortices from the motor system. So if you think about it like that, you have a beat in your brain. This is sort of the beat. And this is your prediction, your motor prediction. And then you have something in a prediction error from the auditory cortices because what comes in is, for instance, uh, syncopation, Da, 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 da. So that doesn't go along with the one, two, three, four. So, so now, of course, you could, uh, you, your brain could start to think, okay, uh, is it the right? Do I have the right? Uh, your motor system would would say, okay, do I really have the right prediction? Because it it's at odds with what what I listen, what I hear. And then, uh, in order to try to to establish the prediction, you might tap your feet, and that would actually give you some feedback from your body, and maybe also some auditory feedback. That's what you can hear when people dance. You have also a lot of auditory feedback from that. Or you might clap while while uh, that that is also one way to to move your body or, or, or bob your head or whatever we do when we listen to to music. So that reinforces your your prediction. Of course, it's still challenge because it's the same prediction error that is coming in but at least you know that and you also know uh, this from studies tapping studies is when you you produce your tapping then your predictions are also more precise when you produce your uh, uh, the rhythm for instance so that's that's basically the idea and so and yeah. yeah so yeah i mean i guess the yeah the confusion i guess was that how does um reinforcing the the beat reduce the prediction error of the syncopation because the syncopation is still the same, right? But is it just that you're reinforcing the framework within yes, which you're interpreting yes. it? Yes, I, I don't think it, it's... You, you have to understand, it's not necessarily that the brain is capable of reducing the prediction error, but this is its task. So this is what it's trying to do. So it's trying to say, well, okay, this was simply wrong. Here is the right uh, place for the beat to be. And okay, it was still wrong, but... It, it's the process of reducing prediction error. And that's also probably what makes it pleasurable. Because at least the way I think about it is that, that it's, it's, it's uh, the process of reducing prediction error that, that actually make, where you actually, how can I explain this? This is a long, really long explanation. But the process of re- reducing prediction error is something that is good for, for learning. Because you will you will become better at producing the beat, and that means that you uh, you will have more precise predictions by being challenged, and then have to produce the beat. For instance, that's basically what we do when we learn. This is, of course, uh, uh, not explicit learning; it's implicit learning. But if we, if I were to to when I practice, for instance, I often do uh, I practice practice on my bass. I've done that for many years, where I play uh, you know walking bass. That's what all bass players practice ding 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 but then i practice to have the three against four in my feet which makes it harder but that actually f- reinforces my my sense of, uh, of the meter so so uh, so and 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 you know learning is actually pleasurable to a certain amount when you when you hit the sweet spot be, be, between what is really too hard for for you to understand and too too easy for you to understand so this is where and we know that from monkey studies from uh, uh Wolfram Schulz uh, monkey studies that 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 in there there is sort of this sweet spot in between where you, where you are where, where the monkeys are more rewarded uh, so, so I think this is the way it 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 it, uh, it it is meant to to be understood. 
I'm sure that Carl could say this much more eloquently, but then you might also lose, you know, you, you lose exactly what he was saying. But uh. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah. I mean, I had that once because I did a master's project in his lab, and then he explained uh, something to me, and he's like, "Does that make sense?" I was like, "Yeah, not." I mean, I'm sure it does, but not to me. <laughs> no, you know, it's it's poetry. It's poetry when he speaks. So um, I'm just trying to, you know, put it a little bit more down to earth, so that, yeah. Yeah. By the way, I hope that so you have a few examples from funk music in this. I hope that these were examples that he came up with. I would really love if he was just really into funk music. Uh, I I, so. I don't think I, I I have to say I wrote most of that article, and, I, I and the, the the others were were mostly um, were, were very very important uh, in discussing and commenting on the on the stuff. So, but I I don't know why the, it's it's especially funk music because I'm not I'm not particularly interested in funk music it's just a very yeah i i guess it's it's instructive we also have a beethoven uh i think i i have to, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, yeah if you mention these eight notes yeah almost too uh you know yeah almost too down to earth but but um but you don't have a beatles example right if i remember correctly i do have a beatles that's in the first figure it's we're Sergeant Pepper's oh, Lonely sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hearts okay. Club Band. Forgot about that. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so you yeah, did yeah, get yeah. them in. Okay, I yeah. did get them in. <laughs> and that was the hardest part about getting it published. You know, it took six months to get the royalties or to get, to get the copyrights for for these three bars of Beatles. It was so really? annoying. It was so Even annoying. Just for the transcription. Just for the transcription, which I did myself, by the way. Yeah, I was. I assumed so. <laughs> So it, they, okay. But did they, did does like Nature Publishing have to pay? Yeah, probably. <laughs> does Michael the, Jackson actually own the Beatles copyright? Wasn't that? A yeah, thing? Uh, nah. He, he bought them back. Uh, McCartney bought them back. I think. So. Ah, okay. So, so that's, uh, a, that's good. He's getting. It. Yeah, I think it was good. He was so annoyed about it. I think because it was. I I don't know. Uh, that's, that's yeah. A yeah that's story, a different yeah. story. Anyway. Um, maybe the last section of your uh, of the article is something that uh, is also slightly more related to actually what I do because it's about kind of this interpersonal synchronization or rather um, interestingly I mean I do kind of dyadic interactions but for strategic decision making so you know not I don't care well in my research at least I ignore like all of the complicated voice and face stuff and all this kind of stuff right and just go to the strategic stuff um, but I guess the last part is kind of about these social interactions and, uh, yeah, and I guess kind of how music can also help um, study those kind of areas. And um, I, I quite like the kind of uh, some of the finger tapping experiments and the, the kind of three dynamics that emerge from that. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? And Oh, yeah, uh, I, I love them also. It was something that we started a long time ago when I suggested it to one of the other PhD students before I had my own center. In uh, it, it was another person's PhD stu uh, study, Ivana Konvalinka, uh, Konvalinka, or and and the it was so simple, and there was it was so difficult to model. She's an engineer, really, uh, really clever engineer, and it turned out to be pretty difficult. The idea is you put two people in separate rooms, you ask them to tap their fingers, and you, they can hear each other in, in some of the instances. In some instances, they can only hear themselves. But then you, um, they, tapped, they tap together, and when they tap together, uh, they are told to synchronize and keep the rhythm, so keep the tempo. That's the o only instruction. But then it turns out that at this very uh, low level, they will be most of them will be so called hyper followers so if one goes faster on one beat the other one will go faster on the next beat but then the first one will go slower so they sort of oscillate between and this was uh, and that was actually most of the participants that did this which and this is not something that you are aware of because it's it's like you go ding 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 and you try to keep the tempo right and then you 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 try to but but you you you're really fast at oscillating in this sense and uh, what we have then done uh, is that we have tried to have people tapping with different models predictive models and and when you when you do that you can see that the models in at first you become not very well synchronized but then after uh, some bars you you synchronize again so so having different models 
either means that you are converging in the models, which probably is what happens, that you change models because you, for some reason you can feel that, well, this model wasn't, it wasn't the three against four, it was probably just the four or, or whatever. So so you can see this at the tabling level, level uh, that you have these interactions, uh, minimalistic I I interactions. But then what happens when you, when you scan the brains or you use EG to measure... Uh, 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 measure scalp potentials, oh. yeah, oscillations, and and so forth. Then what you can see is suddenly that there are many things that you can see, but one of the things is that you can see that you have sort of an oscillation in the brain that that goes with your uh, with your own tapping, but you also have oscillations that monitor the other person's tapping. So. The way we did this, and I can't, I, I can't uh, take any credit uh, of this because this was actually uh, Ul Adrian Heckley and Mattia Rosso from uh, IPEM in, in Ghent. So what they suggested was, or it was probably Mattia who suggested this, was to take two metronomes. People were tapping to their own metronomes and they were slightly apart. So in the beginning, they would be very <laughs> close together and then... Uh, they would sort of uh, go in antiphase, and then after t uh, uh, 32 iterations, they would be back again, right? And and what you can then see is that there's actually a beta burst oscillation. It's sort of underlying uh, the oscillation, so you should beta is like 20 hertz, so it's pretty fast, but it's like when you tap, you it, it goes like this, the brain will go something like this. So there's sort of an underlying oscillation that gives you this slower oscillations that, 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 that is consistent with your tapping. But what you can then see is that if you are told to keep your own rhythm, but you hear the other or you see the other, then there's another... Yeah, there, there's also an oscillation that goes zzz, 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 to the other at the same time, not as strong as your own. So you're monitoring the other person. And that means that this super low level musical interaction, which is, I mean, we do that in music all the time, right? We keep rhythm with each other and sometimes they drift a little bit apart. And then we know this guy's a little bit apart, but we have to stick to our own beat, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is actually subserved by neural oscillations in in the brain that monitor our own tapping, but also predict the beats of the other person. And in the predictive coding framework, what I find interesting here is that when you have uh, when you are playing together, then in the beginning you might be uh, in in different worlds. When if you do free jazz, let's take the it to the complete, and you start the you in the beginning you do free. I actually did it uh, two days ago. I was playing a gig uh, where we 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 play some free jazz. You know, just completely free, like we didn't know what was to happen. So we asked so, the audience. Yeah, briefly, yeah, so, how does? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, maybe in general, just read it. Does it? Is it like? Do you have some sort of thing you start when you say, "Let's start on this key," or do you say, "I don't know"? It's just like someone starts and then sometimes, takes, yeah. sometimes there's also a theme. Sometimes there's nothing, so you just play. Or sometimes it happens when you if you play a standard or a, a song, and then in the end of the song, suddenly it, it goes into some kind of free direction. Uh, there are many different ways, but, but, uh, and of course, free is not completely free. You're always bound by, by stuff. But, uh, but, but anyway, uh, what we did in this uh, instance was that we asked the audience for three notes, and unfortunately, they gave us, uh, what was it? They gave us, they gave us uh, E flat, E and F. <laughs> okay. du, du, du. So, 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 you know, yeah. it was pretty boring. But so, and in the beginning you're far apart, you're three musicians, you're playing and you have your, have your own stuff going. But what you need to, to do is sort of uh, harmonize your predictions. So suddenly you get into some kind of predictive framework. It might be a tonality, it might be a meter, it might, it might be neither of these things, but still have an idea, oh, this is where we are going. So you harmonize your predictions. And this is, of course, the extreme example, but it happens in all kinds of music. You can also hear it, hear it when you listen to, for instance, uh, symphony orchestras. Sometimes they're not really together in the beginning, and then suddenly they, 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 are, they, are, they are. But 
so what you're in principle doing is that you're harmonizing predictions at different levels, the vertical, the dynamic predictions and the short-term predictions. And this tapping together is an ultra minimalistic experimental setup where you can uh, use to, to try to, to manipulate, for instance, the relationship between the two persons, like the social relationship between the two uh, persons. So, so this is uh, this is the whole field is going in that direction at the moment, I think, and uh, and we are, we are we are part of that, of course. But it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I really liked how you know I really love if you have a very very simple experiment and you can already tell so much with it, and I think that's a great example of it. Uh, maybe my last question was we're talking about uh, jazz and compositions. It was a really interesting sentence in uh, this this article um, about jazz compositions that I'd never thought about that much because I you know I don't I never really play jazz per se, and you you wrote um, in jazz one of the most important purposes of compositions is to serve as a framework for solos to impro improvise on. Yeah, and I thought that was really interesting because you know I come from a classical perspective where it's pretty much like these are the notes, play them, and <laughs> um, so I'm just curious like how does I mean I don't know whether this is probably a very difficult question but like. Yeah, how do you compose something if you if the goal is not to, to yeah to not lay out the notes but rather to, to provide this kind of framework um, into which people can insert their own kind of ideas? That's a very different way of composing, right? What a wonderful uh, question! Now I've made seven records in my own name, name, and for all of those records, I had a band in mind when I wrote the compositions. So when I when you when you uh, write jazz compositions, there are a lot of things you need to think about. There's one thing where you need to think about how groovy is it? How groovy do I want this to be? What do I need in my set? So you can't have a record where you just play ballads. You can, but and and and, and people do that, and that's also nice. But but in a way, you have all these constraints that you have to think about beforehand. Then I think about my, my current band is uh, Lars Jansson from from uh, Sweden, is fantastic uh, piano player, and I know ex he's he's an extraordinary player. He can play anything, and he really likes likes it if if it has some, either has some really groove to it, so it's not just like uh, ting 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 ting, but it has like a, a, a bass. Uh, so so it has some kind of funky groove to it. He likes that, but he also likes it if it has a lot of changing harmonies, so that he because that really challenges what he can do. So when you write your composition, even though you need a melody and some chords and some uh, some uh, groove or, uh, or kind of uh, at least an idea of how how what the drummer and the bass should be playing, then you still need to think about what do the different musicians that are going to play this what 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 will will make them be able to express or give them most freedom to express their own personalities and. And how so it's a really good question and I can tell you that and now I, I just composed fifty new songs that we have to record when I've stopped being tired or I'm still tired from this record we just <laughs> did, which was really fantastic and yeah, but also exhausting. So 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 uh, but we have to to do them. And for those songs I I have really clear ideas about why I made them in this way. Uh, so so there's a negotiation that has to take place, but it's not different from from Mozart. Uh, when I mean, and I, I'm not comparing myself to Mozart. <laughs> Don't worry. But uh, but I'm just saying that that it's not com uh, different because he, of course, knew he needs to have a symphony. Now I need to write a symphony, or now I need to write a piano concerto because it has to be used in this occasion. And who? Can, what can they play? What can these guys actually play? What would be difficult for them to play? Because you know also the symphony orchestras, they don't like, I mean, the violinists, they don't like just to go, ee, ee, ee. I mean, they want some food. So, so, so this is not different from that. Uh, but, but of course, when you have to, the thing is that when you then make a jazz composition, after I've done it and you know the, the chords and the, the harmonies and the melody fit together, but then I try to play solo myself on it and many times I make a reduced score 
uh, for the for playing solo on. So if I might have, for instance, a C minor chord and an F minor and a, maybe a, an A flat a seven chord in the first bar, but then I might just reduce it to one C minor chord uh, for that whole bar because uh, that then then it gives them more freedom to improvise on without losing, of course, the sense that it's still the same song. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's part of that equation, in a way. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I never thought about that. It's yeah. The, the, the I like the comparison to someone like Mozart because you do have like this is the orchestra of the court that I'm that pays me to do this thing, so, and these are the musicians, and this you know they have this many of these instruments, and yeah, what can they do? And yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I've I've run through my questions. Uh, is, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add. Otherwise, no. uh, I, 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 I lo- lots, lots of stuff I want to uh, add, but I would encourage uh, people to re- read the article. I don't know how you. Uh, it's it's interesting for me to meet somebody who has actually read uh, the the paper, uh, but I have the feeling we try to really make it accessible, so readable, so that I mean maybe the predictive coding part is a little bit rough, or that's that's tough to get through if you have never heard about predictive coding. But I think that the parts about, uh, you know, we have melody, we have harmony, we have rhythm, then we have groove, we have uh, musical interaction, we have a little bit about uh, improvisation and, and, and also pleasure and also mu- musicianship. So there are lots of things where you can actually get the short story of what happened the last 25 years, I guess, in, in neuroscience. So, and and you know when you write for Nature Neuroscience, they have a whole team of people who will just keep on on, on asking you questions. Do you really mean this, or is what you actually mean this? And then you say, "Oh, I never thought about that." It's actually a good question. And then you have to refine it. So, I would say it has really been. There's nothing in that article I think that I I don't believe in, or uh, I, is an uh, is a mistake or or something. So if you disagree, that's really good because I like disagreement uh, for the scientific purpose of it. But these are at least the things that we wanted to express. Yeah, and I agree. Like um, also what you mentioned right at the beginning. Um, this is not just about predictive coding. Um, you know, you do summarize a lot of other music that you don't need the predictive coding framework for to for the studies to make sense yeah and i don't know i mean i may be not the 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 best person to judge how readable it is given that i have that kind of predictive coding and music but yeah. uh yeah i've i found it very yeah i guess easy and accessible to read so I, at least from my perspective yeah. that, the, that so that the two works. of us we are comp- we completely agree that this is a very easy to read <laughs> yeah, exactly <article. laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs>